please stand together. It's good to see you here this morning. Let's raise our voices and hearts to, to Jesus, our Savior, our King. Lord, we Lord, re enter your presence, Lord, with hopefully with hearts full of gratitude for all the things you've done and for who you are, God. And, and Lord, if 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 not gratitude, if our hearts are perhaps some some of us here with hearts full of sorrow and, and pain, Lord God, we and we also bring that to you. You are our comforter, Lord. You are um, our rest. Um, help us, Lord God, to, to rest in you, especially when the world is just so so crazy all around. We rest in you, we trust in you, we put all our hope and trust in you. Jesus, the name above every name. And so God, we bring also all our, our, our worship and our, our adoration to you, God, today. We say thank you for all the things you've, you've done. You are great, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. You are holy, Lord. Receive our worship this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You call me out upon the waters, the grace unknown.
match the King of Kings.
God fights for us. So God, we give you our praise this morning. You're worthy, Lord, of all our praise, of all our, our adoration, God. And Lord, we give you our attention now. Speak to us, speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please turn around and say hi to somebody? Good morning. How y'all doing? For those of you tuning in online, we want to say welcome. We certainly appreciate you tuning in and joining us. We're blessed to have the opportunity to do church together. So thanks again for that. For those of you that are here, thank you. As you see, we changed the configuration of the sanctuary just a little bit. We may do some more changes next week. And so thank you very much for doing your best to social distance. If for some reason you need a little extra space, there are some cards randomly in the back of uh, in some, it, in aisle to aisle if you want to set one of those next to you so you could space out a little bit or have some space between you. Space out a little bit didn't sound right, did it? <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't do that when Brian's teaching. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then we do have a couple of announcements we'd like to talk about. Our Moms on a Mission. Um, we're starting up again, Moms. So that'll be Mondays beginning January the 25th. We'll be at 7 p.m. We'll be here at church. We'll be out in the courtyard. Um, the meetings will be held twice a month and we'll go through May the 10th. And so if you want to get signed up for that, you can go directly to our website and get signed up there. Or you can contact Jessica. And Jessica uh, works in our office now. So if you call during the afternoon after 12, um, she'll be able to give you those details. So call in if you have some more questions. And then, ladies, we also have a Monday Night Live. It's a 10-week study beginning February the 1st. It will be, we're going to be using that book called With. And so Brian had us give that out a few weeks back. Um, so if you haven't picked up a copy yet, you there's still a few here that you're welcome to pick up. Um, as well, you can go online and, and order a book if you'd like to. In that book, the format that the ladies will be using, there's some questions at the end of each chapter, so you'll be answering those as well. Kelly will be in a de doing a devotional study with some additional, um, additional questions. And ladies, you'll be meeting here at 6.45 p.m. on Monday nights. We'll social distance. It'll be just like our Sunday morning here. Eventually, you'll break up into small groups after that devotional time, and it'll be an opportunity for you guys to discuss those questions. So please read the chapter ahead and be ready to chat with, uh, with the ladies. You don't need to register for this one. You just need to show up. And again, that starts um, the 1st of February. And if you have questions, or for those of you online, if you're interested in Zoom, we're still weren't sure if people were ready or want to continue with the Zoom. So if you would like to do that, if you'll contact Kelly directly, you can either call the church office or send her an email, and she'll work out those details uh, with directly with you. Our biblical counseling classes. So if you have ever thought about joining our biblical counseling team, if you'd like to know a little bit about biblical counseling, if you're interested in learning what that training is like, we're, we have an informational meeting uh, right after this service. We'll be in the Agape room. Pastor Dan will be hosting that. So again, this is not a commitment to say you're going to become a counselor for us, but if you're curious about that, what the class would look like, what what that looks like to get to get that kind of training today is that informational meeting. And so if you just uh, stick around afterwards, Pastor Dan in the Agape room over here on my left will be, uh, will be sharing that at that informational meeting. And then community groups. So excited to announce our community groups are going to be starting back up. And uh, there's a place for men, women, uh, young and not so young, as Andrew Paulson would say, to hang out discuss God's word. It's a great opportunity. So there are several locations for you to attend. And if you'd like to get signed up for it, it's a great opportunity. It would be okay even if you did that. Now you could take your phone out and download our app. Or if you already have the app on your phone, you can register right there. And then there'll be different areas. And so some of those will be meeting here and the other ones will be meeting out in the community. So if you want to get signed up for that, that would be awesome. And then Marietta Pantry Food Drive. And so our ability to continue to pour right into our own community, we have an awesome opportunity to continue to partner with them. They are looking for specifically canned veggies and Robin. Robin. That'd be ramen. Man, if I could only speak English, this would be a lot better, huh? Um, and so that's my given language, apparently. So as you saw the trailer um, out here and the, and the sign that said Food Drive, we'll be out here again next Sunday. So if you want to bring that with you, if you're not able to bring it, you could bring it to the church office between 8 and 4 p.m. For those of you who are tuning in online, if you want to drop that off during the week, that's great. Um, and then we would like to take that all over to them after our next Sunday. And then Perfecto Mobile Coffee Shop, um, they wanted to participate with us. And so if you find them out in the community, they're going to donate a canned good 
for every cup of coffee they sell in the next two weeks. So great opportunity for us to partner locally. All right, Brian, please take this over. Well, good morning, everybody. A couple more uh, announcements we have. First one is uh, today, three to five, our children at risk. Uh, this uh, month is the National Human Trafficking Prevention Month, and so we're going to talk about prevention, and uh, we're going to spend some time praying specifically for uh, Justice Matters 10, which is coming up in two weeks. And so on January 31st, uh, we take uh, the last January every year, the last January every year, the last Sunday in January every year to, uh, uh, to highlight and talk about what's going on in human trafficking. Uh, Dr. Sandra Morgan has uh, been our kind of MC for a long time. Uh, she heads up uh, in uh, Orange County at Vanguard. It's called the Global Center for Women and Justice uh, for uh, Vanguard University and has done probably the most work in Orange County on this subject and has done training and everything else. She's an incredible lady. But Kelly was talking with her and uh, since she's been uh, appointed as co-chair of the Public-Private Partnership Advisory Council in Washington, D.C., she was telling Kelly, I have learned so much being able to sit at the table with the top leaders throughout the country to be able to discuss these things. I've learned so much. Well, we've already looked, always looked at her as knowing the most, and now she's saying, I've learned so much, I can't wait to share. So we're, we asked her to share. And so I'm going to start off sharing on uh, in uh, the book of Amos, chapter 5, verse 24, where we took our theme. It's called Let Justice Roll. I'm going to share on that for a little bit, and then I'll turn it over to Sandy, and, and we'll do that at both the 9 and the 11 o'clock. So just wanted to let you know that'll be uh, coming up. And then we just started the book of James a couple weeks ago, and so if you'd like to join us at 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights, we meet right in here, and uh, I'll be teaching in James chapter 2. So come on out for that. Now this little guy I met in Morro Bay, and I took a picture of him. Where is he? Come on. There he is, because that's what I got to do all last week. For seven days, I got to take a sabbatical. So thank you, church, for allowing your pastor to go for a week and just go do nothing all by myself. And I take my camera, and I go take pictures. I take walks on the beach. I just get away from humans uh, the whole entire week. It's awesome. And so it was absolutely beautiful, and I like, like to just share a couple things uh, that the Lord showed me in that, and we'll jump into Acts 24. We're made in the image of God, and there's so many books written about our potential. We've been made in the image of God. Look at our potential. The flip side of that is that we're made from the dust, and we have such limitations as humans, and there's no books written on that. <laughs> that's not going to be a top seller, right? You have limitations. We do have limitations, and that's why he gave us rest from the very beginning. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, and it was something, and I, I read uh, or listened to a couple of audio books on that. One was the uh, relentless Elimination of Hurry, which is a must-read. It's a hipster pastor guy up in Oregon that wrote it, and uh, uh, John Mark Com Comer, and did a great job. The, un the Relentless Elimination of Hurry, an incredible job. It's hard to slow down. Now, he takes it as like a Sabbath as a command to do, and he says, he says, I don't care if you do. That's how I take it in Scripture and what it means. Here's how our family does it. You don't have to. That's not what it's about. He's simply saying rest is a good thing. God built it into our lives where we need that rest. Here's what happens when you get rest. And he gives some practical ways to be able to do that in a very hurried lifestyle that we live. Normally it takes me two to three days and then I can start slowing down and do this. This time it took like four to five days before the Lord just said rest. And I set my camera aside, wasn't going for walks or anything else. And it's just like, what does this mean? And I, I just really felt it was a time... Listen to this. Out of the whole Message Bible, there's one verse. Eugene Peterson did the far best. It's a paraphrase, but I'll, I'll call it a translation of uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He said, are you tired, worn out, burn out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. And he says, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. It came to a place where the one day, remember when, uh, you know, the, the movie Elf, you know, at Christmas time with, uh, what's the guy's name that plays Elf? 
<laughs> yeah, Will Ferrell. And so remember when he tries to start singing the song and he's just like talking words? Here I am. Is what it is. That's, that's, what I, that's what your pastor was doing. I was on this rock ledge and looking out in the ocean. It's just like, okay, I'm alone. I don't know what to do. <laughs> and so I'm not, it's not my time to do my devotions. It's not my time to pray. It's my time to sit with God. And as we say, it's not an easy thing to do. What the heck do you do to just to be in his presence? What does that even mean? And so I'm having all of this kind of sing-songy conversation with him, and I finally shut up, and it was beautiful. And I was just looking at the expanse. I was up in Pismo Beach, and I was just, it was a just gorgeous week, and just looking out of the ocean there, and just, it wasn't a time to talk. It was just a time to sit, maybe even a time to listen, but practicing his presence, practicing just doing that. Now, you don't have to take seven days to get away. We don't all get to go do that. I am just was blessed to be able to go do that. But I'm saying, here, here's your challenge for this week. Five, f- find five minutes, <laughs> just five minutes, just to sit before him. I'll tell you, it'll be the hardest thing you ever do. And I guarantee it's one of those things where, and that's what I'm learning, it's something that I'm going to practice to learn how to do. It's going to be something I... I'm not trying to get something from God, not trying to talk him into something. He's not trying to get something from me. It's just learning how to be with him. It's just something I'm learning. If you have a hot cup of water, you're going to make some tea. Our devotion time seems to be like we're that cup of hot water. And when we do our devos, it's like one dip of the, uh, of the tea, tea bag into, into the hot water there. Well, what happens if you just do a quick dip like that? starts to bring some color out and you dip it again and as we do our devos as we memorize scripture as we pray it's the more times we're dipping in that and a sabbath rest whether you take it on a weekly basis or there's sometimes is putting it in and letting it seep and letting it just be about you and your god it was beautiful and i just wanted to share that with you as a thank you that i got to go do it but i pray that you would learn how to uh, kind of come on a journey with me and let, let's learn how to practice how to just sit before him because i tell you what your brain's going a thousand miles an hour and i love photography and so it's like there's a bird there's a bird. i could you know just to set it all aside and just be able to sit and so when i saw this guy i thought that's what i want to do all week that's what i want to do if you've ever been up to morro bay it's they're fun to watch all right let me pray Father, teach us how to do that. We always want run around wanting to do something for you or just feeling guilty that we're not doing something that we ought to be doing. And, uh, but those times of just rest. You built us this way. You made us this way. And so help us to learn how to do that. As we follow the unhurried Jesus. Never in a hurry. Teach us that life. Teach us that lifestyle. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's catch up. We're in Acts chapter 24. And we left off in Acts where there was this uh, plot to kill Paul. The plot was found out and foiled. That was chapter 23. Paul makes it safe safe up to Caesarea. He's down in Jerusalem. He had uh, two times had to go before the council. And... uh, and they're trying to find out, you know, you're coming against Judaism because you're following the way, this, this new Christianity thing uh, that we would call it today. And so because of this plot, they end up sending him up to a place called Caesarea, about 60 miles up north, up on the Mediterranean coast there. But they send two centurions, 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to guard him and take him all the way up there to make sure that he'd get up there safe. And now he's ready to experience his first Roman trial. So he had two Jewish trials. He's going to have three Roman trials uh, before he gets sent off to Rome. Vance Hafner said, whatever Paul went through, excuse me, wherever Paul went, there was always, it always broke out in either a riot or a revival. And so in this chapter, what we're going to see is a great courtroom drama. Like if you watch uh, Law and Order, the dun dun, you know, would be the good time for that to take place right there. That's what's happening here as we get to watch this great courtroom drama kind of play out. Uh, I've entitled uh, for our message uh, the first, kind of cut it in half this chapter, the first half with Paul before Felix. 
Felix, uh, not Felix the cat, but remember Pontius Pilate, he basically took Pilate's place. He's two guys later, but that's what he is. He's the governor, so he's working for Rome. He's Roman, and he's working for Rome and uh, the region there. They didn't have a base down in Jerusalem. Their base was up in Caesarea. Uh, when you go there, when you travel there, you'll see all, the, all, all of the... Uh, what, what they found right there in that area. We know the spot, the, the area where this had all had taken place. And so we're going to read from verses 1 through 21. And we'll first talk about, again, Paul before Felix. And then we'll see how the tables get turned. And it's going to be Felix before Paul. Verse 1. And after five days, high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul, and when they had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, so he's the spokesman, he's the orator of the group, and he starts speaking. Since through you, he's talking to Felix, we enjoy much peace, this is called flattery, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and in everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. Verse 5. For we have found this man, Paul, a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you'll be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. And that's the end of his speech. Verse 9 tells us the Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that these things were so. Verse 10, when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, so now Paul gets to speak, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you, this is a court case, a legal court session here, and so you'll hear a lot of that kind of lingo. And so he say, neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, again, that name for Christianity, the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. That's, a, that's what they would call the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. And so uh, he's saying, I, I, I'm believing in the same God that you guys are believing in. You guys have just missed out on Messiah. Verse 15, having a hope in God, which these, uh, these men themselves accept that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. And while I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd, excuse me, or tumult. Let me pause for just a second. Remember where he said, there are all these accusations. He says, hey, I was only there for 12 days. And out of the 12 days, seven of those days, he was purifying himself up in the temple. It's like, when would I have been able to do all of these things? That's kind of part of his argument kind of behind this here. He says, but, middle of verse 18, end of verse 18, but some Jews from Asia, actually the Turkey area, they sought to be here, they, excuse me, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation. They're the ones who said these things. They should be here to accuse me. Should they have anything against me? Verse 20. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. That's the council, the Sanhedrin, that he met with twice down in Jerusalem. Other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. We start off with this guy, Tertullus, and... Uh, We have here the case of the, the prosecution here. You ever watch uh, Dr. Bull and uh, Benny, his sidekick? You know, these high-powered lawyers, that's, that's who this Tertullus is acting as here. He's the high-powered lawyer that's coming in, the hotshot attorney represent, representing his Jewish plaintiffs here. And so uh, what he starts with is this nauseating flattery. As he's saying these things about the Roman governor Felix, they hated Felix. They, all, they hated all the different governors. They hated Rome being in their country. They hated everything about them. And so to be able to say, oh, these such wonderful things about them, it's all just flattery. 
But flattery appeals to our pride. Somebody said, if we didn't flatter ourselves, others could not successfully flatter us. But we want to be flatter, flatterized. Flat, you got it. The problem, we, we really want to believe what they say. And so a flatterer is a man that tells you your opinion and not his own. You have brought about such reform in our nation. No, they didn't. It just took 472 soldiers to take one man and get him up to Caesarea in a safe condition <laughs> because there's all these guys that wanted to take his life and you couldn't protect him. That's the only way you could do it to, to protect him. And so a lot of reform in our area, no. Napoleon said, he who knows how to flatter also knows how to slander. And that's what we see. Basically, as he stands up, he's laying down these three counts of slander, these three false charges that he brings here. He, first of all, he just starts off saying... This man's a plague. It's like, you know, when you can't come up with a, a, a word, you just come up with, he's a monster. You know, he's just, that's what he can't, that, that's the best thing he could do. He's, this guy's a plague. He's worse than COVID-19. And so that's how he kind of starts. That's not really not a charge, just saying he's a bad man. His first one is a personal charge. He stirs up riots. The Greek word is an insurrectionist. We've heard that word in the news the last couple of weeks against our president, insurrectionist. Tertullus knew Rome wouldn't stand for unrest, sedition, insurrection, whatever you want to call it. They're not going to stand for that. And so this is a lie. He didn't do this, but it is an effective charge. So that's his personal charge. The next one was a political charge that they coupled Paul with messianic movements. There's been a lot of messianic movements. Guys would show up there in Jerusalem saying, I'm the Messiah, get a bunch of people to follow him. And usually there's a bunch of blood and bloodshed and a number of things happening, like uh, Pilate ended up killing a bunch of people for doing that. Those kind of things would take place. And so he's lumping them into that category. Tertullus knew Rome wouldn't stand for another false Messiah, hysteria, uproar thing to take place. And so again, this was a lie, but a very effective charge. Thirdly was the doctrinal charge. He was a defiler of the temple. Now, really, what the guy said, what Tertullus said, he didn't say that he did profane the temple. It says that he tried to. So he really didn't do it. And so he's not, he can't be guilty of that. So it was a lie, an effective charge, but not really because it wasn't true. All that takes place. And then verse 9, the lawyer's last weapon, you call false witnesses to the stand. So we had a bunch of Jews that were in the area and they said, yeah, we heard that about him too. What was Paul doing during this time? Well, he's not doing anything, but self-controlled and silent. We've all watched those court shows on TV where somebody just can't handle it anymore and it's not their turn time to speak and all of a sudden they just yell out or stand up and the gavel comes down, take that man out of my courtroom and starts getting a little crazy there, right? But that's not Paul. Paul's just sitting there and he's waiting for his time. And so all the way through this, it's just that time where you have to experience God's peace even though they're lying against you. Somebody's standing there lying against you, all these accusations. It's very serious. You're in the court of the land and what's going to happen? But he sat there, sat there in God's peace. Now it's his turn for the defense. Tertullus was very general as an order of just these basic things here. Paul, you're going to hear him or as we read him, used, uh, uh, he was very specific in his uh, answers to these things. Tertullus used flattery. Paul simply, proper formality, was nice enough. But basically, <laughs> actually, I like how he starts. He says it this way in verse, where was it, 10. Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation. <laughs> he doesn't say whether he was a good judge or a bad judge. It's like saying that, I know you're a man. And anyways, well, and then he just kind of just goes on. So it's just a little bit of a formality in the front, but let's just get to the truth. And so he does that. And so starting in verse 10, he lays out his defense. He's basically saying, my religious uh, record is clear. Verse 15, he says, having a hope in God. Now he defines it as hope in the resurrection right after that. But his hope is in God. We all remember the hymn, The Solid Rock. On Christ the Solid Rock, I stand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I learned when I was writing this down that it's, it's darkness hiding God's face. I think when I sang it before, and maybe not watching the words close enough, when darkness hides its face, which didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but there are certain things that separate us out from God. It could be sin, 
but it could be the devil stepping into a situation, but it's something that's like, I'm not hearing God. We hear the psalmist cry out about that. God, where are you? I've been crying out to you. I beg you to hear me and hear my cries and hear my petitions. And, and it's, it's that. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. He becomes my hope. He becomes my stay or my stability or my, my ability to be able to, to stand in verse 16, he makes a statement. I think it's one that we should all uh, grab. It's at the top of the screen there. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. You know, if you and I did that, we would always fulfill the Ten Commandments, right? The first four towards God, the next six towards man. That's what it's about, loving God, loving our fellow man, and just doing that. And he's saying what he does with his conscience, that that's so important. And since we celebrate uh, MLK Junior Day tomorrow, uh, I thought it'd be great to quote from him what he says about conscience. He says, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic or wise? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? Martin Luther King Jr. goes on to say, and there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, my conscience is clear. I strive for that, that my conscience is clear before God and before, and before man. Our photoelectric smoke detectors that we all have in our house the way they simply work is there's a little light beam inside there and it just stays. And as long as it reaches the other connector on the other side, as long as it's hitting that beam, kind of like our garage door openers, right? It has that beam across the bottom there and it hits the other side. And it's when that beam gets broken is when it goes off. And so there'll be a little bit of smoke. There could even be, if you have one too close to your kitchen, some of the track homes did that. They put them too close to the kitchen and even steam from your stove can set them off so they shouldn't be right next to the kitchen. But anyways, steam, smoke, whatever it is, it breaks the beam and that's when the alarm goes off and our conscience works the same way in our in ourselves it resembles that that alarm sin might be that obstruction and blocks that connection of that light of God's spirit in our life and when that gets broken the conscience signals us that there is a life-threatening danger there's something going on there's something not right here and it needs to be fixed and that's what Paul says that he makes it his aim to make his conscience clear before his God, before his fellow man. Well, he goes on to say that his uh, civil behavior has been blameless as he's talking about uh, the, the, the Asian Jews, again, the Jews that lived over in Turkey, that they should be here. They got something against me. They should be here to be able to speak it up. And so basically, here's his formula. Uh, whoops, sorry, that was my uh, smoke alarm. Forgot about that one, sorry. No witness equals no evidence equals no convictions. That's, that's what he's laying out to these guys here. Want to play court? Let's play court. And so as he gives his defense, that's what he lays out. No witnesses, no evidence, no convictions. The defense rests. The court basically is going to recess until Claudius Lysias, he's down in Jerusalem, until he can come up uh, to, uh, to be able to uh, testify and to be able to, uh, to take it from here. Let's look how things flip around here, starting in verse 22. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, so he knew about this movement of these Jesus followers, he put them off saying, when Lysias, the tribune, that's Lysias, Claudius Lysias, the tribune comes down, I'll decide your case. So he's putting it on hold. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. And so he's, uh, he's kept in prison. Now you would think, okay, I could do a week. I could do a month. It's going to be two years we're going to see in just a minute. So anyways, he's not going to make a decision. He leaves them in jail. Verse 24, after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak. Listen to about what? About faith in Christ Jesus, and as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. Those four things. Felix was alarmed. I'm reading out of the ESV. I don't know what yours says. Terrified, uh, scared, you know, whatever else. But Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. And when I get an opportunity, 
I will summon you. He shuts down the preaching of Paul and says, hey, I want to hear that. It's just not right now. Somewhere out into the future. Verse 26. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he's hoping for bribe money. If I keep him in jail, maybe he says, listen, if I get you this much money, will you, will you let me out? But uh, that wasn't happening. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, which I always like to remind pregnant ladies, if you're looking for a good name for your baby boy, there you go. Porcius Festus would be awesome. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. I love running across those names. I always like uh, just helping out, you know, any way I can. All right. Though his enemies couldn't prove his accusations, obviously, as we said, Paul didn't get to go free. But it's safest for Paul to be in prison. Remember, there's a whole, people, a whole lot of people down in Jerusalem that had swore, we will not eat again until he's dead. That, that was the oath that they placed upon themselves. So a lot of people want him dead. The safest place he can be is right there. But you say, come on, two years? Now, in uh, chapter 23, verse 11, see... There's things we don't get, but there's things we don't understand. If you're Paul and you're sitting in prison, again, week, month, okay. We're going, God, this is getting old. You know, God, I didn't do this. They're illegally holding me. He didn't do anything wrong. Like if you ever did prison ministry, you'll hear that a lot. You'll, you'll talk with a lot of people and there's so many people in there that have not done anything wrong, <laughs> guarantee it, <laughs> right? But, but here's one who's sitting blameless. And there's no reason that he should be in this Roman protection during this time how can God explain to him I need to get you to Rome right that's that's what I had promised you and I had already used 400 and whatever it was 72 soldiers to be able to get you there I brought you to this point and now I got to get you to Caesarea to Rome and in chapter 23 verse 11 Jesus showed up to Paul and said stood before him and said take courage for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem so you must testify also in Rome and if this is the only way through the situation there to be able to stick him in prison for two years, if that's what it takes to get him to Rome, that's what he's going to do. There's one of those situations where when you don't get all the answers, Paul didn't know. It doesn't say that Paul anywhere or any hint. It just kind of whips past it in within a verse saying, oh, by the way, it was two years and keeps on going. Man, that's tough. But he had some liberty. Friends were able to show up. And so with that, he's in the palace. That doesn't mean he's living in the palace. He's down below the palace. But uh, down that, he's just, he's being held. Uh, but he has a lot of freedoms while he's being held there. But let's talk about the guilty governor here. As where it starts, Paul puts Felix on the stand of a higher court. That's, that's, that's the reversal here that, that takes place. I want to give you a little bit of backstory because for the four reasons, the four things that Paul talks with him about why he picked those four. Here's the background. Drusilla, I call her Drusilla DeVille. She has, a, she has a background, okay? And her whole family background is the whole Herod fan, right? So Herod the Grip of the First, Herod Agrippa the First is uh, her dad. She was barely 20 years old at this time. She had been married to a guy named Azizus. He was a Syrian king. His name was uh, 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 Emessa, I got to put on my glasses, I can't see that. Emessa, yeah. And so uh, he married her when she was 16, going on 17. But th so she gets married at 16. And so what happens is this uh, uh, Felix ends up getting a Jewish magician named Ast Astomus and ends up uh, convincing her to leave her husband and to marry him. So this is number three wife for Felix. That's where she came from. And so this whole thing and their wedding and everything else was just weird and wrong. And that's why Paul is going to talk to them about the high moral demands of God. And that's why as he talks with them, yeah, I'll talk with you about some stuff. Let's, let's talk about these things. And that's where it says, and that's why I kind of stopped on that word where it says that Felix was, in the ESV, alarmed. Actually, he was terrified of what he was hearing here. There was conviction starting to hit the heart and he was getting nervous. That's why he shuts down the sermon because you're either going to respond to that, you're going to melt and say, God, forgive me, or you're going to say, that's important and I need to address that one day in the future. 
And he does. He brings him back for more preaching. And, you know, and like, I, I like hearing him. Let's, let's, hear him. let's hear him speak. And that happened over and over and over again. Drusilla's family, they were very involved in the way, in the followers of Jesus, to the tune where Grandpa was Herod the Great. He tried to kill all the boys uh, under the age of two. He did kill all the, the little boys, the little toddlers under the age of two, trying to find the Jesus child and have him snuffed out. That was uh, Grandpa. Then there was her uncle, uh, one of the other Herods that ended up killing James, and it was her dad that ended up uh, what did he do? I just completely blanked. No, excuse me. It was her uncle that killed John the Baptist, and it was her dad that killed James and then got eaten by worms in chapter 12 that we had read about. And Drusilla, we know exactly how she died and when she died. She died on August 24th, AD 79, in case you care. It was because the, she was living in Pompeii, which is when Vestuvius, the big volcano, went off and killed everybody in that, uh, in that area. And so she died in that thing. So that's her. That's her. Felix knew he was guilty. The gospel does have ethical and moral implications. And again, it started getting a little too close to home. And Felix stops the sermon. Verse 22, Felix's mind was informed of these things. In verse 25, his heart was touched in that he was, again, feeling this. Uh, he, was, he was afraid, but he, didn't, he wasn't willing to obey the truth. Mind was affected, heart was affected, but the will didn't kick in to do something about it. So it's obvious, it's obviously not enough to know the facts about Jesus, that you know a bunch of things about the Bible, you know a bunch of things about God, and even have an emotional response to a message that it's right. You must willingly repent of sin and trust the Savior. In John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus said it this way. He's talking to a bunch of Jewish religious guys, and he says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. That by reading a book, that by, be, by reading these words, even though they're truth, by reading just the words alone, that that's going to do something for you. He says, and it is they that bear witness about me. See, you're missing it if you're just reading words on the page and don't realize that all the words in the book are speaking about me. That in them you have eternal life. It's about that they bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You're missing that next part. Yes, you're reading it. Yes, you're studying. Yes, you're memorizing a whole lot of it. But you missed it that is talking about me and you missed it in the sense of not coming to me in whom it was talking about to be able to have life. When Paul got audience, the four things that he's thinking about, this is what I need to share with him, is the first one is faith in Christ Jesus. All Old Testament scriptures, again, as I said, were about him. Jesus said in the Gospels, he says, Moses wrote about me. Before Abraham was, I am. Abraham couldn't wait to see my day. You know, and he starts laying all these things out. Basically, what Paul's saying then is, I believe the Scriptures. I believe Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament Scriptures. And you should believe it too. I don't know if you noticed or picked up on that or not. But when it introduced Felix's wife, Drusilla, it says one thing about her in the text. Who was Jewish. So she has this background she gets what's going on. She knows enough about this. And what he's simply saying is, Paul's saying, I'm as Jewish as these guys. See, a lot, of, a lot of times we as Christians, we think that the Old Testament was for the Jews and the New Testament is for the Christians. No, that's our book too. Did it start their book? Yes. But as Jesus said in the Gospels, everything it says in there is about me, then it becomes our book too. And so we believe in both the Old and the New Testament. So what Paul's saying is, listen, the New Testament wasn't written yet. So he's saying, listen, brothers, listen, we, we both believe in the Old Testament scriptures. What you're missing is simply that Messiah came and he was the one that it was about and he's the one who I'm following. And so as I'm believing in resurrection, I'm believing in Christ and you ought to too. Next thing he talks about is righteousness. You and I, 
we're comfortable matching ourselves up with other people because we'll always find somebody worse than us and saying, I'm not that bad, right? And so with that, it's a crooked standard, right? We're all crooked sticks. We'll picture that. Just picture we all get to go outside and we find a crooked stick laying around and you can try to find the straightest one you have. It's not perfectly straight. It's going to be crooked. But it's easy in life to find somebody with a more crooked stick and you look at their life and you go, what a joke, I'm not that bad. This word righteousness shows up and it becomes the yardstick. It's a perfectly straight stick. It's God's expectation on us. You say, Brian, that's being perfect. Brian, that's, that's impossible. I know, but listen up. So, so what he's saying is, so he's talking about righteousness with them. Let me define it. It is a standard determining what is conformity to justice, law, or morality as given by God. Not that we invent or we get to come up with. But it's this let me say it again, a standard determining what is conformity to justice, law, and morality as given by God. He says, I don't want to talk about your mistakes. I don't want to talk about your weaknesses. I don't want to talk about what you inherited from mom and dad. I don't want to talk about faults, errors, sin, that you are not perfect, that you are broken, that you're bent, and you're bent towards sin, and that's what needs to be resolved. Now, let me explain in a one sentence maybe two, the difference of the bad news and the good news. The bad news of the gospel, well, it can't be of the gospel because gospel means good news. The bad news and the good news. So the bad news is a holy God demands righteousness. You will not get to heaven unless you are perfect. I'm saying it right here, saying it right now. That's what it is. That is the bad news of this book right here. A holy God demands perfect righteousness. Ready for the good news? Yes, I am. He also provides it through his son, entrusting in his son, Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. And that's where he says, Brian, I'll take every one of your ugly sins. I'll take them upon me, upon the cross, and I give you my perfect righteousness. So when you show up to heaven, it's not, I did this good. I did that bad. I stand in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's where God the Father Puts on his Jesus glasses. He looks at me. Huh, I see perfection. Come on in. That's what happens. The bad news, the good news. That's why he's talking with them about righteousness. And then about self-control. Especially sensual desires. So that, that's what he's talking with them about here. Today, man can control just about everything except himself, somebody said. And that's the point that he talks with the guys like, well, I don't even have to say too much on that. You guys are just messed up. Lastly, about the coming judgment. We must do something today about tomorrow's judgment. I did. I did it at age 19. I only knew God as judge. I couldn't have articulated it this way back then. But ultimately, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, he is one thing to you. He is your judge and awaits to judge you at the end of your life here. And you'll be judged and then there's damnation to hell. That's the way it works. If you repent of your sins, grab his righteousness, right? And that's what Jesus offers. When that takes place then, he immediately moves. He is no longer judge over your life. He becomes your savior. That's what changes when we get saved. And so with that, we must do something today about tomorrow's judgment. And so at age 19, for me, that's when that flip-flopped. And he moves from judge. And so he says, well, what? You're not going to get judged for your sins? Oh, no. I was judged for my sins. All on the cross, every single one of them, when I confess them, they were all taken care of there. The price has been paid. Let me wrap up with this, procrastination. And I, I don't want to talk about, we don't have time to talk about procrastination in general. We all have an issue with that, right? I'm talking specifically about procrastination to salvation, like our friend Felix did right here. And he falls off the, the pages of Scripture we never hear about him again. Uh, well, what we hear about him in history wasn't anything good. And so with that, one of the problems of procrastinating salvation is this. You put it off for a time. Let's say that time is going to come again and somebody else is going to witness to you saying, bro, you got to repent of your sins. You got to believe. What happens the next time that the truth is shared to you, you don't have the conviction that goes with it? Because you kind of need that. It takes God to save you. You don't just do that on your own. It's, it's a miraculous thing that takes place with regeneration. 
we can be convicted and we can have, I'm losing my C word, conversion. It, it's, that's man's side of being converted. I repent, I turn, I believe. There is steps that I'm taking to be converted, but he actually does the miraculous step of the regeneration of the heart, making a heart new. That takes him. And so with that, I'm not saying you won't hear truth in the future. What I'm saying is, can you bank on being convicted by the Holy Spirit to draw you to himself at that time? I'll wrap up with this story. There was a meeting down in hell and four of... Uh, of uh, Satan's uh, top uh, demons there, he asked them, hey, I want you to think up a new lie that will trap more souls. First one says, I have it, I have it. He says, let me go down to earth and tell people there is no God. Satan says, that's not gonna work. People can look around them and see that there is a God. Second guy says, I got it, I got it. Let me go down and tell them there is no heaven. He suggested, and so Satan says, that's not going to work. Everybody knows there's life after death, and they all want to go to heaven. Third guy says, let me go down, tell them there is no hell. And he says, no. Conscience tells them their sins will be judged. They have a conscience inside. They know that their sins one day are going to get judged, and we need a better lie than that. Finally, the fourth one said, I think I've solved your problem. I'll go to the earth and tell everybody there is no hurry. Procrastination. Just put it off for another day. Next week. Yes, Jesus is real. Yes, heaven is real. Yes, you need to get saved. Yes, you need to turn from your sins tomorrow. That's all he has to whisper into the ear. And that's what worked for Felix. Don't let it happen to you. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you in a day of salvation. I've helped you. And then he says this, behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Well, the conviction sits there today. And I'll give you a chance to respond at the end when I pray to be able to raise your hand and say, I want to respond to that today. And back in Isaiah, Isaiah said this, seek the Lord while he may be found. Sounds like kind of a time limit to that. Call upon him while he is near. The best time to trust Jesus Christ is now. The best time to tell others about Christ and his good news is now. Let's pray. Father, I want to pray for uh, just anyone here that uh, maybe needs to respond to that today. Where you're challenging them with this, this reminder not to put it off till tomorrow. But to be able to turn from their sins and believe on your son Jesus today. To replace their sins for your righteousness. And God, you still offer that today and we say thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did in paying that price for us on the cross. Thank you for our ability to be able to respond to that. And so God, we pray that you would help folks that need to do that today. And so before we end, I'll give you an invite, just invite you now to just raise your hand before their eyes close and just in the middle of our prayer here, I'm just stopping to say, just put up your hand between you and God and just say, Lord, I, I, I want this today. I want to make sure that I am forgiven of my sins and to believe on him. And I'd like to say a prayer for you. And so just go ahead and put up your hand. I see that hand there. Anyone else? I see another one there. Anyone else? There. I'd like to respond to this and make sure that you walk away this morning saying, I am a child of God. All right, you guys can go ahead and put down your your hands and just make this your prayer. Father, I do recognize I've sinned against you, not only in my actions, but even in my thoughts. I bring to you all of my sins and I ask you to forgive me. Thank you for what your son did for me personally on the cross. Thank you. And I accept this forgiveness. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I invite you to come live inside of my life and and, and change me from the inside out. And thank you for your promise that you'll never leave me or forsake me. Thank you for this free gift of eternal life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen. Let's welcome these guys into the kingdom. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand for our last song.
built along the mile I wasn't created to bear it alone I hear your invitation to let it all go to the Father. I hope you'll find your five minutes this week and go and do that. You know where God showed up to me? It was about the third day in, and it was uh, Saturday night, and uh, I thought, I'm going to go to church up here. And so I pulled out Yelp and find a church. And so I start going down it, and I find this New Life Nazarene church. I said, eh, looks good. I'll go to that one. 
and they're meeting out in the parking lot. And so I went and uh, purposely did it to where I get there right when it's starting so I didn't have to talk to any humans. And because uh, I, was, I was in my m- m- monastic moment. And anyways, you know what he spoke on? No lie. He speaks on the, how the Sabbath rest and why that's so important for your soul. And he's the one who recommended the book. As I'm driving out of the parking lot, I'm dry, I, I pulled over and I downloaded the book and I started listening to it. And it's what, what most ministered to my soul. And I went home and I was like, or back to my little motel. And I, I was just was like weeping before the Lord. It's like, you do love me. And you might not think a pastor ever struggles with that, but it felt like that fog in between me and God. And it's just at that funky place of where is he? And it's just like in that little thing that he did. It could have been any church that I picked. It could have been any sermon that he was going to preach. The book that he recommended, it just fulfilled the whole rest of the week. It just started at that moment. And I even said, I even texted a couple of friends. And it's like, God likes me. It was awesome. It was so beautiful. And I pray that you'd find that moment. Your moment with the Lord in doing that. Oh.